like camera off or anything just letting you know um so welcome everyone um this is our second event of our high tide speaker series um that we have for our 2024 winter high water season um so we're hosting a series of speakers around the high tides this season uh with the goal to gather folks Along the, along the coast to um, discuss, observe some changes to our coastline and better understand the implications of coastal flooding and sea level rise in our communities. Um, so my name is Abigail. I'm also joined by um, my colleague Maggie from our education team at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and we're both going to be monitoring the chat uh, during this call. Um, so please put any questions or comments into that chat, and um, if it's not answered right away. We'll make sure uh, to follow up with you after that. Um, all right. So the topic of today's conversation is uh, building community knowledge. And so we're lucky to be joined by um, Municipal Climate Action Program Manager Gail Bonus and Climate Engagement Specialist Steph Sun from GMRI's Climate Center. Um, and then in addition to all of our experts here at GMRI, we have um, all of you joining from your own communities as uh, experts in your community. So we're really excited to hear your questions and comments as well. So we're gonna start today off with um, a quick introduction of the Coastal Flooding Community Science Project um, and talk about some upcoming events, how you can get involved. And then I'll pass it over to Gail and Steph for a quick presentation um, and then open the rest of our time for Q&A. Uh, so again, just drop any questions or comments into the chat and we'll be sure to read them out. So the Coastal Flooding Community Science Project is um, a community or citizen science project where folks um, take photos and make observations in their community. And the goals of this project is to gather local data, increase uh, community awareness and engagement of flood vulnerabilities, and um, inform local and regional decision making. So this past January, many of us uh, may have experienced the impacts of coastal flooding as we saw storms go up uh, the coast and hit our coastal communities. Um, and many of us may have also experienced flooding during February, during some sunny days, um, as we had astronomical high tides that hit our coastlines as well, um, which brought water further up onto our shores. So it's our goal that participants in the project um, experience a sense of purpose, empowerment, and connection to community to help further our resilience. Um, and so this data is being used by the National Weather Service um, and local decision makers to improve models and develop more uh, accurate flood alerts. So it's super exciting to have all of you on the call from all over the region. Um, I saw there was a bit of a variety in the chat, which is really great. Um, this map that I pulled up here shows places that we already have um, the project, the Coastal Flooding Community Science Project established. Um, and they have established monitoring sites where we either expect or have gathered observations of coastal flooding during um, predicted high tides and storms. Um, but with that being said, we need help from everyone along the coastline. Um, and you can either choose a site in one of these pen communities or go out somewhere else that you value. Um, and all these observations, whether you see flooding or not, are super important for us in understanding the changing coastline and the impacts of coastal flooding. So um, some plans for this month. We're meeting today to talk about building community knowledge um, and then get energized to go out and make our own observations during predicted high tides. Um, the highest tides of this month are from March 9th to the 13th. Um, these times will vary on location and I will uh, follow up with some of that information. Um, and then we're all gonna join together uh, back again on March 19th at 6 p.m. to uh, discuss what we observed. Um, during these uh, days of high tides, we also have a number of um, community organizations who are hosting coastal meetups to get uh, folks out in the community all together, making these observations, uh, running through the protocol together, um, and just chatting about the impacts of coastal flooding to their communities. So again, I'll send um, this list of dates and times of the high tides. Um, information about the project page, which has uh, information on how to participate, uh, how to uh, enter data. Uh, there's a whole discussion forum on there um, and some safety measures as well. 
make sure to go out with a buddy, um, bring some friends, neighbors, uh, family members, anybody out with you, um, and don't go out during really intense storms, um, and do not wade in the water. Um, and then I'll also send out a list of meetup locations as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to send it over to Gail and Steph from GMRI. Um, and yeah, I had one more point, but I don't remember what it was. So I'm just going to send it over to them. <laughs> thanks so much, Abigail. Um, yeah, thanks all so much for joining this evening. Um, a, a big piece about doing community science work is the data gathering, but it, the other component of it is that we get to engage with community members um, in various ways. And, and it's a way for us all to take action within our own communities that supports um, building our capacity towards building resilience. Um, so I'm gonna share a little bit of a background about kind of Maine um, more broadly and why we're doing this work, um, mostly focused in Maine, but this applies to other areas um, in other states too. And then Steph will talk a little bit about how we do this work and think about it through our programming. So you can pop to the next one, Abigail. Great, thank you. Um, so as, as you know, Maine's pretty rural. You may not have known that we are actually the most rural state in the nation. And the number of different municipalities that we have is quite vast. Just along our coastline, there's 144 coastal communities. And looking at these bar, this bar graph, you can really see that um, the majority of them are not just rural, but like kind of micro rural. Um, when we do this work and talk with like other kind of states and ask them about if working with rural communities, some of the rural communities they describe are about the size of Portland. <laughs> so Maine's quite unique in the way that our municipalities are made up um, and also kind of how small these municipalities are. Um, so it provides like some challenges and opportunities for doing this work, um, which I will dive into on the next slide. Thank you. Um, so some of these challenges are around, um, hey, focus attention over on the yellow map first, is kind of the capacity within um, within these communities to do this work. So um, not very many communities have a sustainability department, have even a town planner, um, and some may not have more than like, say, one full-time person who's working at the town office. And if they do have that person, they're probably very much focused on lots of other things, such as logistics of how a town needs to operate on the day-to-day, -day, and they don't have the capacity to really think forward into how a community is going to look into the future. We are lucky in Maine that we do have regional planning offices that think about countywide um, planning and do provide some support. Um, a lot of that uh, capacity, though, as you can see on this map, is in the areas highlighted in blue, which are more in southern Maine and the greater Portland area, whereas the areas in orange and yellow have a little bit of that capacity. And then the areas in red, there's almost no planning capacity within those communities. And so what this means is that communities are mostly doing their planning through volunteer effort. So kind of the benefits of that is that instead of having um, top-down, department-level, or town-level um, plans being made, it's a really bottom-up effort, and it can be really community-driven and community-engaged as we start to understand what our vulnerabilities to climate is and um, start to envision what a thriving future would look like for our communities underneath these conditions. Um, kind of similarly, too, if you look over at the other map, looking at our vulnerabilities to um, sea level rise, as well as our ability to adapt. So this map is showing us those two different factors kind of in the same. So an area that has um, low vulnerability to sea level rise and also um, kind of high capacity to adapt to sea level rise would be um, in this lighter pink area. Whereas the purple, dark purple communities would be, um, they're more vulnerable to sea level rise and also don't have that capacity um, at an individual level to adapt. And so when we're thinking about social vulnerability index, again, these are making kind of broad assumptions. And for the most part, it's based off of like federal data, federal level data. 
Um, so that may be talking about um, older uh, populations within a community, folks that live alone, communities that have um, kind of need to travel further for health care access. Um, but that doesn't mean that those individuals don't have that strength and ability to adapt. It's making a lot of kind of generalizations. So just want to point that out. Um, so we can see though that looking down into Southern Maine, the percentage of area lost to sea level rise is actually higher than it is in kind of down East Maine, but the ability to, to adapt is much greater in Southern Maine than it is in kind of mid coast and down East. So these are kind of some of the challenges and opportunities that we have within these challenges um, to address sea level rise issues. So you can pop to the next slide. Thanks. So what we're planning for as a state around sea level rise um, is looking into towards the future. Like sea level rise is something that it's we've already been experiencing it as long as we've been collecting data. We've been seeing sea level increase and it's increased 7.5 inches since that data collection has begun. Um, what we're planning for into the future as a state is an additional foot and a half based off of the year 2000 level. So it's on top of that seven and a half inches by um, 2050 and four feet by 2100. And these are what we as a state have agreed to commit to planning for. Um, but there's also a recommendation that we need to be prepared for upwards of three feet by 2050 and 8.8 by 2100. Um, the prepare for conversation is more around spaces that um, if it gets wet, it fails. So thinking about places that flood and would cause failure would be emergency evacuation routes, emergency services, um, such as hospitals, fire stations, um, and that. And some places can flood and can get wet now and then, and that's okay. So um, that kind of commit to manage level is more appropriate for planning for that. Um, so all with all of this information, what we're trying to do is to bring all this together and support communities in building resilience. Um, you pop to the next slide. Thanks. And what we mean by resilience is building, um, it doesn't mean that a community isn't going to experience climate impacts, but rather a community has the capacity to recover from climate events or climate impacts that may be happening. Um, whether that's um, more frequent nuisance flooding, which is sunny day flooding, um, or if it's coastal storms or extreme heat days in the summertime. So it's reducing that kind of bounce back time um, or reducing the impacts from those events that come, come along. And this also brings the question too, if we're going to be planning for this future as opposed to planning for kind of the state of our communities right now, it creates this really great opportunity for us to start to envision a future that our communities strive towards. If we're going to be investing in change, then we can really invest in that vision. So that's another um, way that we work with communities. So you can pop to the next slide, Abigail. Thank you. So really start to envision um, if, what can what can our communities look like and how can we thrive um, in a future with warmer water or warmer air, warmer waters, higher seas, and how can we maintain and have our sustainable fishing industry, resilient working waterfronts, um, maintaining and keeping our ecosystems healthy? How can we strive towards having happy, healthy, and I would add equitable um, communities? How can we not just build towards science education that's meaningful, but build science literacy, data literacy, climate literacy? Um, how can we have a strong economy? What are the opportunities as we're kind of bouncing forward towards um, that climate future? Is there opportunities for blue economy in there? And how do we maintain and grow our sense of place and our cultural identity kind of through this process? So this is how we think about our communities and kind of the issues that they face, the challenges, but also those opportunities that are embedded in there. And I'm going to pass things over to Steph to chat about kind of the process piece. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for making the time to be here tonight. Um, so as Gail said, I'm going to talk a little bit about community driven planning processes. Um, and so you can see here that community uh, that knowledge and power building is sort of a central component of um, a community-driven planning process. So building knowledge through activities like 
coastal flood um, monitoring and community science are really integral to a planning process that does come from the bottom up and captures sort of the visions, values, concerns of the community. So if we go to the next slide, um, with this coastal flood sort of community science project, we started off with project co-development. And so that's really a, a pre-planning phase to collaborate and lay the foundation and groundwork that enables broader participation and community building. So in this project that looked like, um, you know, collaborating with municipalities and organizations to decide where those initial monitoring sites would be, and also to form partnerships and relationships um, with different communities and organizations, recognizing that every organization has a different connection to a community knowledge base. And so ensuring that we build those relationships to be able to tap into the vast array of community knowledge that exists. And then moving into sort of the next stage is really the core part of what we're trying to do with community science, which is that knowledge and power building. So um, community knowledge and power building, they really make decision-making processes in a planning you know, process much more accessible and democratic in the sense that they build a sense of civic leadership that can be kind of distributed across a community more broadly. Um, and, you know, this process is also really about acknowledging the knowledge that community members already have, um, especially that intergenerational component. So the knowledge that older generations are able to bring to the table, as well as the new knowledge um, that younger generations are bringing to the table. And it's creating that opportunity to bring knowledge together as well as build new community knowledge. And so this can look like a lot of things. Um, and so, for example, through some of our project work, we've looked to support that intergenerational collaboration um, with some amazing team members who've worked really closely with educators to develop classroom curriculum on, on coastal flood community science and coastal flood science that really supports knowledge building for students and young people who are also members of the community um, and who are also experiencing the impacts of climate change and working to bridge that gap through authentic experiences. So going out to see flooding for themselves, um, engaging with property owners who are trying to sort of manage those um, impacts and really building the opportunity to have the language tools science to support the impacts that they're going out and seeing through sort of the, the coastal flooding um, meetups or walks. And so having these first hand experiences as well as that background information, that science, the language to talk about these things is so valuable in building opportunities to engage in those important conversations and bring those concerns that community members have to the forefront of a planning process in the way that you might not have been able to if you took a sort of a, a bounce back or business as usual approach to coastal flooding where, you know, all you're doing is trying to manage the impacts um, that you're currently facing as opposed to integrating or thinking about what is the future that we want um, in that process, which brings me to my next slide, um, which is really that vision and values building component. So as I mentioned before, community knowledge really exists across generations. So we have knowledge about the things we've seen in the past, as well as the things that we hope to see in the future. And so that community knowledge is formed um, by experiences and they're linked by shared values. That's not to say that these values are really fixed, right? In so many ways, they're being challenged by the climate impacts that we're facing. But, you know, when communities are equipped with that community knowledge um, that has been built, this can form the foundation for a conversation around what is valuable to a community and beginning the process of envisioning what a community might want in the future. So as community knowledge and participation grows, there's a greater opportunity to build that kind of cohesive and inclusive and equitable ground up vision for the future, um, as well as really cultivating a sense of possibility and opening our eyes to solutions that we might have overlooked if we hadn't pulled upon that system 
of community knowledge that already exists. And sort of with all that background work, we're able to move into this space of problem definition, right? So in that pre-planning phase, there might be questions that have already been predefined, but really localizing those questions and thinking about them on sort of a systems level really requires that local context and that community knowledge. It's an opportunity to ask new questions and so much of, you know, so many of the solutions that one might come up with are really bounded by how we might define a problem to begin with. So community knowledge really helps us take that systems level approach, um, not only to think about coastal flooding in a vacuum, but also think about what are some of the other challenges and opportunities that your community might be facing so that you could define a, a challenge like coastal flooding in, you know, in relation to other challenges that um, your community might be facing, like around housing or food access. And so it's really about connecting the dots across knowledge bases, challenges and opportunities to be able to lay the foundation um, to develop sort of robust solutions. Which brings me to sort of the next stage. Um, so really critical in a lot of uh, resilience plan planning processes are assessing vulnerability and community assets. Again, this is a big opportunity for community science and participation in, in projects like coastal flood monitoring can be really critical. So um, oftentimes vulnerability assessments might represent a moment in time, but with a community driven planning, community knowledge and the centering of that community knowledge, you have an opportunity for a more constant or consistent view of what's happening across a community's assets. So you have both sort of breadth geographically, but you also have um, really valuable insights around time, which can help you develop sort of deeper understandings of the, the implications of asset vulnerability. Um, you can leverage historical knowledge within a community. So what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked. And within this opportunity, you're able to sort of assess vulnerability and comment on vulnerability with an eye towards those who are actually experiencing those impacts firsthand, as you might be when you're, you know, trying to go about your day and there's a, a super high tide. Um, and then also the ability to tap into a whole new world of information. Um, the way in which community science has the ability to really bring so many people together around a single issue creates the opportunity to kind of create this whole new wealth of knowledge and information. And then I think within that, a really critical piece is the ability to um, view assets as really integral to a community, um, which just allows, you know, this planning process to be like empathetic and acknowledging that this is a difficult thing to do. Um, and that, you know, building resilient strategies is this community wide um, effort. And so sort of this last stage um, is solutions development. And so with the really wide lens that building community knowledge kind of gives you, one can start thinking about the principle of bouncing forward as opposed to just bouncing back or business as usual. So community science has been around for a while, um, but through leveraging that community knowledge at a systems wide level, uh, you can really start moving into that space that's more transformative that centers community values and really um, helps move the conversation into thinking about new opportunities. Um, one example I really would love to highlight is um, we run a scenario-based planning exercise and uh, we've done this in a few communities that have also participated in the coastal flood project and it's just incredible to see how with, you know every group we've done this with you know everyone comes up with new, unique, and interesting solutions, and they're never the same. So these novel solutions are really coming from unique local contexts and bases of community knowledge that gets placed at the center of a planning exercise, um, like planning forward. All right, and finally, like this process is iterative. It repeats itself um, through centering community knowledge. You can then continue this process of co-developing continuing to build knowledge and power to increase civic engagement, 
and again, go through this process over and over. When you, we're thinking about resilience, like I think oftentimes we want to think that we have an endpoint, but that process of envisioning a resilient future, um, a future with new opportunities. Uh, that everyone can you know benefit from is it's an ongoing process and um, community knowledge then becomes something that you can really hang your hat on um, in iterating through this process and centering community values as they evolve and as they change. And that's my my piece on building community knowledge through this process. was really valuable I think to break down the whole process and see how many people it takes to build that community resilience and at every level so important um so as folks are thinking of questions that you could drop into the chat um just wanted to go over some so this weekend to the beginning of early next week um March 9th through 13th uh are the predicted high tides for this month. Um, so we have a few folks who are hosting events um, on March 10th and 11th, and I will send the details of that. But we have um, Herring Gut in Port Clyde. We have um, Portland Trails in Portland and uh, Downey's Coastal Conservancy and Main Coast Heritage Trust up in Machias who are all hosting events. Um, and then um, after that, we will all join again on March 19th at 6 p.m., uh, to be saw and just a nice open conversation um, about the uh, impacts in our communities. And then we're doing all of this again in April. Um, so we have a whole series in April um, based around informing decision making uh, around the science project. So if there are any questions, you can drop them in the chat. Um, but again, thanks, Steph. We have one question in the chat already so far, and uh, Gail already went in and, and answered it. But for anybody who's watching the recording, I thought we could share some resources out loud. Um, but one person was wondering about where to access um, tide data and water water height data, specifically historical data and not necessarily future projections. Yeah, a great tool that I like is NOAA's Tide and Currents Water Levels tool. Um, and it links through to like national sites, national coastal sites where you can access this data. Um, it has um, site, the type of data you might be able to get from the site differs from place to place depending upon the technology that they have there. Um, some places have existing um, tide gauges that have been in place. In Portland, it's been for like over 80 years that we've had been collecting data there. So we're able to um, have uh, that current water level data that's that's being measured and is a part of it too. Some locations they have gathered their, they, if you can gather data within a 30 day window, you can predict tides for 19 years. Um, so some of the sites are based off of a water level monitor that's been in place for a short period of time, so it doesn't have that current data, but you can look into the past and see the past predicted data, but not the past actual data. So there's some differences between the sites. Any other questions coming in? No, I mean, we, that was a great presentation, you guys. Thanks. A lot to think about. Thank you. And Dicey, are you guys the ones out on Great Diamond Island? We are, yeah. We're in Virginia awesome. right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we divide our time. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a really great network of folks that are summer and year round residents out on Great Diamond doing some really interesting work. And yeah. Uh, yeah. we've uh, got some coastal flood monitoring sites out there as well, which I think gathering that data will be helpful. And it's also a great way to 
um, get more people engaged. Um, there are some, it's a really odd predicted water year, water level year. There's some um, predicted high tides, I think even into like eight August and September. Usually we don't see them until much later in the fall, but I think you'll see them during summer season this year. Yeah. Now we found out about this whole meeting from the GDI kind of network. Adam's sister, Adam grew up in Portland. His sister lives in Cape Elizabeth. She was like on the, on the coast. And I mean, the water came over her, her wall in January. So mm -hmm. it's been an eye opener. <clears throat> yep, for sure. I'm curious, Gail and Steph, if there's been any kind of changes in conversations since these past storms in January. You want to take that one, Steph? Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, so I'd, I'd say I'm most keyed into the conversation around working waterfronts. Um, and I think, you know, it, it seems very obvious, but maybe we weren't thinking about is that when we're looking at climate impacts that are so widespread as a storm and on top of a high tide, the whole coast gets hit at once. And so it's, you know, a really interesting space because it's really brought a lot of people together in terms of talking about um, the impacts of coastal flooding and sea level rise. Um, and then on the side of, you know, recovering from those storms, I mean, there's a huge backlog of projects right now. Um, and so in thinking about say working waterfronts that need to be ready for the lobstering season, um, there's this really big question around prioritization and timing, um, for lack of a better phrase, like when it rains, it floods. And so uh, that's also, I think, a really, you know, critical component of this conversation is recognizing that this is happening all at once. Um, you know, what, you know, how much does it make sense to plan on a property by property basis on a community by community basis or town by town basis? And where are the opportunities for sort of more regional, sorry, my cat is like pulling my lamp down. Um, what is the opportunity for a more, you know, regional um, or statewide approach in recognizing that these impacts will be coming across, you know, the whole coastline all at once? Are there any examples that um, you can share of just innovative things that communities are doing, either, you know, sort of starts of projects or ways that people are bringing, you know, community members together? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, can I, I'm going to think about that one. <laughs> Like there's lots of examples, but I had in my mind I was getting ready to answer Robert's question. I'm going to jump into that one first. <laughs> um, Robert, you asked about kind of a correlation between like topographic or land based elevations and high tides. Um, I'm going to drop in the chat a link to um, Maine Geological Survey Sea Level Rise Viewer. Um, Carol had shared one for NOAA, um, which is more national based. The reason I like Maine's is that it's based off of our highest astronomical tide, which is 12 feet. Um, the NOAA viewer is based off of a 10 foot um, and we exceed 10 feet 50% of the time. Um, so when you look at these viewers, when you see flooding come onto land, that it shows you where the water is going based off of LIDAR data, which is our way of measuring much more granular elevation than topographic maps. Um, and so planes fly over the land and they shoot lasers down and how quickly it takes for that to reach back to the plane tells us what the elevation is for that um, site. And it can read through trees um, to hard infrastructure. So you really get kind of like a clean picture of the of the landscape. And that's the kind of more detailed topographic data that we use to determine where's the water going to go once it exceeds um, kind of flood stage or goes beyond the coastline. All right. Well, I was chatting about that. Steph, did you think of any examples on that? And I'll think now too. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's lots. Yeah, this is maybe not quite on the like, you know, hard infrastructure projects, but something that is starting to happen that I think is so interesting, um, both at kind of a community level, but also um, is one of the priorities for the Maine Climate Council and thinking about their resilience strategy is this concept of um, like personal resilience. Um, and so the ways in which like we build psychological resilience to these impacts as well. Um, and so I think, you know, that's sort of a, a new space for me. And it's a really interesting one because at the end of the day, like we have such strong emotional ties to our communities, to our landscapes. And so in thinking about, you know, what novel solutions we might have, my cat, um, there's also kind of value in thinking about like what is our comfort zone and where what are the spaces we're willing to like venture into as we think about how we can address the, some of these problems and so yeah yes i would add another strategy um that we're starting to see emerge is that um Towns are working together and that doesn't sound crazy, but it kind of is. <laughs> this is a state with really deep, re deep roots in local control, which means that municipalities um, have the ability to set their own kind of policies under that. As long as they're addressing kind of the baseline ones that the state puts out, they can adjust them from there for their own kind of municipal goals. Um, and, and, Municipal planning is really, really tied within those municipal lines, but we share coastlines, we share resources, we share roadways that pass between communities that may result, may have, may be vulnerable to flooding. Um, so having this broader scale planning when we're thinking about climate impacts and which areas are more vulnerable than others, how can we put resources in areas that aren't vulnerable? Um, is really important. And so um, there's an emergence of those projects like Portland and South Portland in 2020 released the first in the nation uh, joint city climate action plan, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then um, Steph and I are currently working with the towns of Blue Hill, Brooksville and Surrey on a regional vulnerability assessment. Um, so in part, it allows us to identify these kind of um, more broader regional or shared assets and how they're vulnerable. And it also allows communities to be a little bit more economical um, when they're like looking for folks to support this work um, as opposed to just working soloed or siloed. We have about four more minutes left. If there's any other burning questions for these last four minutes. Um, I, I kind of have a question, but it's also in the form of like a great experience from today. Um, Abby, when you were down, we met up with Kyle from Maine Coast Heritage Trust, and um, he came in today and talked to the kiddos. And I was blown away by how much I really don't know about salt marshes <laughs> and and just the big picture of it. And I was kind of thinking like that, that connection happened because we were out at the same time, right? Looking to collect the same kind of data. And it made me really think, like, I almost feel like I wish there was some sort of a database or a list of, of like, who are our resources, the experts in the field that we can connect with our students. Um, and I've known Kyle for a while, but is there a, a more of a, formal like this is the person you go to for this or weird question but um no that's not a weird question at all and it's actually like because this need for this work and the folks engaged in this work has just grown so rapidly having that like ready kind of database or like old school phone book even just kind of doesn't exist. And uh, so the state has been working on um, a couple different resources geared towards kind of different stakeholders or end users. Sometimes it's at a municipal level, sometimes it's for like homeowners. And so you can find some of those on the DEP website at the state. Um, I'll send some links to Abigail to send out in the follow-up email. 
But some of the work that Steph and I are doing too in communities is, is hearing what their emerging needs are and then creating workshops that match you with like the service providers for those, like to answer those questions or who could address those needs. And those workshops are really focused on um, building those relationships so we can take people take the names and the emails outside of, of those kind of databases and really build those relationships. I think that's, um, I think for us, that's the big joy of working in the state is it really is mean as a small town um, and people really care about this place and, and really want to connect more on a personal level, as opposed to like, just through kind of, well, virtual Zoom is starting to feel personal these days, I guess, <laughs> but uh, um, outside of emails. Maggie, you dropped a great resource in the chat too. Um, through our coastal flooding community science project, there's also a discussion forum, which doesn't get as much use as we wish it would. So if we could really revive that, that would be really awesome. Um, and yeah, we could maybe share some resources through there and uh, share contacts through there as well. Well, thanks everyone for taking some time out tonight. Um, really awesome conversation. If you have any other questions, you can just either email me um, or Gail or Steph. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for, for joining tonight. This was really interesting. Um, thanks for all your work, you guys. Yeah, thanks for putting this on. It's great. A lot. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs> have a good thanks. night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.